Open your Bible this morning, if you would, please, to the book of 1 John, chapter number 4. You know, I had a, a bit of a flashback in my memory while the uh, choir was uh, singing uh, Sweet Beulah Land this morning. Uh, the first time I ever heard that song, and this is sort of intriguing, I was at a camp meeting up in North Florida in a little town called Ulee. Now, probably some of y'all never heard of Ulee, all right? But I was at a camp meeting at a, at a, at a church there in Ulee, and uh, Squire Parsons, who wrote the song, was there and sang it at the camp meeting. First time I'd ever heard it, and I sat there in absolute awe saying, man, that is a good song. And, of course, now it gets sung a lot, okay? Many times at funerals, uh, but uh, also on a lot of other occasions, and I just think it's an absolutely fantastic song to uh, remind us of the fact that, man, we've got some place that we're heading to if we know Christ as Savior that is a whole lot better than what we got here on earth. And so, uh, so I, I, I love the song, but I still remember that first time I ever heard it. So, uh, anyhow had an interesting uh, week this week, did a lot of traveling, uh, thought for sure I knew exactly where I was going with my message for today, but as it happens on occasions, uh, the Lord sort of put the brakes on where I was going and, uh, and sent me in a new direction. So uh, uh, I'm going to give you a, a very simple message today. We're going to literally use one verse as our text. And we're going to break the, te- the verse up into the main points of the text, uh, of the message. So, uh, uh, by God's grace, I hope it will speak to all of our hearts and lives. I know it blessed me as I was spending time preparing for it. But First John, chapter 4, verse 18. Let's stand together as we read the Word of God. Uh, I'm going to read the verse through maybe twice since it's a short verse. So uh, stick with me here and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. The Bible says this, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. One more time, let's read it again. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the fact that we have your word that we can rely upon. We have your word and we are confident that it is the inerrant, infallible word that you have provided for us and preserved for us. And I pray, dear God, that we would just look to you today and, Father, just uh, do a work in every one of our hearts and lives. Lord, uh, I need the truths that I'm going to preach today. This is a need in my heart. And, dear God, if it's a need in my heart, I'm sure that it is the need in many other hearts as well. Lord, just do your work in your way. And Lord, I do pray so much that if there's someone here that needs to trust you as Savior, may today be their day of decision. So bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. The title of the message is Overcoming the Torment of Fear. I I don't... uh, You say, well, preach, that's sort of an odd uh, uh, sermon title. I want you to stop and think about it. If you've ever spent any time in your life being fearful... That is tormenting. It really is. I mean, it's tormenting. And uh, uh, that's not a good place for any of us to be. But guess what? Don't we sometimes find ourselves there anyhow? Okay, let's just face reality. We do. But I'm so glad that the Word of God at least has an avenue for us to overcome the torment of fear. Now, we're living in a time when most of us struggle with fear of some type. Uh, Now, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. I am proud to be an American. Amen? Uh, I believe it is possible to be a patriotic 
nationalistic American and still be committed to the cause of Christ. Okay? Uh, every now and then I'll run into some preacher that is uh, apparently more spiritual than I, and they will say, oh no, we just got to give up on all this, uh, you know, patriotism and things like that. Our total devotion needs to be toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And I got news for you, Jesus is number one. Amen? No doubt about it. But you know what? I can be a proud American and still uh, be devoted uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. If I was raised in Canada, uh, I'd be a proud Canadian, uh, except for the uh, prime minister they've got. Uh, but uh, it, I shouldn't have said that, so y'all forgive me. Uh, but you know what? I'm convinced. I'm convinced that the United States of America, as we know it, could cease to exist today and uh, God's still good and, and He's still on the throne and Jesus is still the Savior. Amen? But I'm going to tell you what, what's been going on in our country uh, has, has really been dismaying for a lot of people. I'm still waiting for some of them politicians to just have their heads explode because things aren't going their way. Uh, and I thought to myself, that might not be a bad thing. Uh, but you think about that, you'll catch it later. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the thing that aggravates me, and I'm going to hit this and move on real quick, uh, they knew from the get-go, did you know to remove the president from office, they would have to have 67 votes in the Senate to do it? They were never going to have 67 votes. Even if, if all the moderate Republicans shifted over to the other side, they're never going to have 67. They knew it from the beginning, and all we've accomplished is getting everybody all stirred up, all upset, all frustrated, and spend millions of dollars, and the end result's going to be the same. You know what? We're living in a crazy time. And it can make all of us fearful. I mean, we're fearful about the next upcoming election. We're, we're fearful about all kinds of things. And you know what? Uh, you know, we might, uh, looking at it more on a personal basis, we might be fearful about our finances. We might be fearful about our relationships, uh, including our family. We might be fearful about our health, you know. Uh, every one of us from time to time have health concerns. Amen. That happens. All right, we might be fearful about our health, or it might be a host of other things. I mean, fear has a way of invading every aspect of our lives and filling us with dread and hopelessness. I mean, that's one of the great uh, difficulties with things like depression, is you get to a point that you do not see a way out. And it begins to overwhelm. And I'm going to tell you something. That can happen to everybody. Martin Luther, the great, the great, uh, you know, one that was uh, involved in the Reformation, battled with serious depression. I've told this story before, but one morning he had been going through a bad a bout of depression and his wife come walking out dressed totally in black. And he looked at her and said, woman, what is your problem? She said, well, the way you're acting, I figured God was dead, so I figured I'd just go ahead and dress in mourning. That got his attention. <laughs> Amen? Listen, all of us can battle with these things. And, and, but you know, I, I'm glad for this. God reveals in His Word that there is a way to overcome the torment of fear, but we got to be willing to take God at His Word. And by the way, that, that's not just a one-time deal. That is a continuous thing. I mean, I have learned that something that maybe I thought I had conquered today, guess what? Tomorrow, I might have to conquer it all over again with the help of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. Because there are things that we're going to struggle with in our life. But just let's, let's look at this uh, verse of Scripture. It really falls into a natural uh, division there for us to look at today. Notice what it says. First, first phrase. There is no fear in love. Okay? There's no fear in love. Now, Part of the problem in today's world is we confuse uh, lust and love. They're not the same thing. Okay? Uh, by the way, even the way we use the word love uh, uh, can, can be uh, uh, misconstrued. 
This morning, I had uh, two men that were being satanic adversaries against me in Sunday school. <laughs> you say, what in the world? Sam Andrews and Scott Martin both came walking in with a box of Krispy Kreme donuts. And I have been battling trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get in a better shape. Now, the reason I say it that way, somebody said to me one time, you need to get in shape. And I said, round is a shape. Okay. <laughs> All right. But they come in with these Krispy Kreme donuts. And I knew that if I took one bite, I would go into a feeding frenzy like a great white shark. <laughs> so I just had to leave them alone. Okay. That was tough. Now, I could say I love Krispy Kreme donuts, but I don't love them the same way I love my wife. There's a difference. I could say I love cream-filled white cream, thank you very much, Krispy Kreme donuts, but not the same way that I ought to love Jesus. See, a lot of times I'm lusting after donuts when I need to be loving the Lord. Amen? There's a difference between lust and love. You know, lust is driven by passion. It's, it's driven by feeling. It's driven by obsession. And by the way, the interesting thing about that is it can be lost at any moment. You know, whenever I hear people say, well, I just don't love them anymore. I wonder to myself, did they ever love them in the first place or did they just lust toward them? Because real love lasts. Real love lasts. So, so really what we find here is love is revealed through trust and confidence. You know why I can say I love Jesus? It's because I've been walking with Him long enough to realize I can trust Him. I can have confidence in Him. He is not going to let me down. People will sometimes let you down. Even loved ones will, will uh, let you down. But the good news is Jesus will never let you down. So we, we can just understand that. And, and frankly, I'm going to say this, and, and, and some might debate me on this issue, but a person that does not know Christ as Savior, an unbeliever, they do not have the capacity to love in a godly way, which is the highest form of love. There are three Greek words are translated love. One is eros, which really is nothing more than lust. Another one is phileo, which basically means I love you like a brother. And then there is agape love, which is divine love, the kind of love that God had toward us when he sent Jesus to die on the cross of Calvary. Buddy, that is divine sacrificing love. And the only people that have even the capacity to show that kind of love are people that, are, that know Jesus as their Savior. So, there's a difference between lust and love. And in the love of Christ, here, here's something good. In the love of Christ, the reason there's no fear in love is because condemnation has been removed. I love Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2 says this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Man, I like that. We are freed from the law of sin and death. I like that first phrase in that, in that passage. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Let me give you two observations. Uh, you say, well now preacher, you, you just saying that we ought to be super Christian and never have any kind of a moment of lapse or, or never have a moment that we, 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 we uh, you know, are impacted by fear or, or anything along that. No, Oh, stick with me here. Let me, let me give you two statements I think will help you. Number one, because I know Christ is my Savior, 
I, I realize something. I may still sin. But sin does not have dominion over me. In other words, I'm not forced to sin. Why? Because I've been freed from the condemnation. The law of sin and death no longer applies to me. I may sin. Now, I did talk to a lady many times. I've shared this before. Uh, many years ago, I talked to this lady, and she said, I haven't sinned in 40 years. <laughs> Ask her if she drove a car. She said, yeah. I said, you ever speed? Yeah. I said, you sinned. No, I didn't sin. That was a mistake. Now, she's probably deluded about other things as well. Okay? No, we all have a problem still with sin. Amen? Okay, I may sin, but if you know Christ as Savior, sin no longer has dominion over you. And then let me tell you this. We've been freed from the law of sin and death. You say, but wait a minute, preacher. I mean, I, I know a people that knew Christ as Savior and, and they died. Yeah. I may die. But guess what? Death will not conquer me. You know why? Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My goodness, how in the world can you lose when you know you're going to wake up in the presence of Jesus? Amen. Amen? Death will not conquer us. So there's no fear in love because uh, condemnation has been removed. And uh, then we can rest in the finished work of Christ. It's not me trying to hang on to Jesus. Man, it's Him hanging on to me. And I'm so glad that that is a biblical reality. Look at the next phrase in this verse. It says, but perfect love casteth out fear. So perfect love casts out fear. You know, perfect love can only be given by one who is perfect. That's Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to make brownie points here when I say this, but I love my wife. But as long as I'm in this present body, my love is imperfect. Now, one of these days, I'll be like Jesus. Amen? Amen? Well, the fact of the matter is still we're... But, you know, perfect love. Not the kind of love we give to each other, but the kind of love that comes from God Himself. That is, is that which should help us to cast out fear. You know why? Because uh, two, two different phrases all used in the same chapter. Uh, back in John chapter 8 and verse 31, we, we find this first of all. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If you continue in My word, then are ye My disciples, indeed and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free the truth shall make you free I've been interested watching the impeachment proceedings and, and both sides are up there saying we're telling the truth all I can say is somebody's lying the real truth will set you free but I want you to realize Jesus is truth personified. If you really want to be set free, you're only going to find it in the Lord Jesus. In fact, that's what we see in the, in the next passage there in John chapter 8, beginning with verse number 34. It says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So what two things sets us free? Truth sets us free. The son sets us free. The reality the reality is that Jesus is truth. And truth is found in Jesus. And if you really want to be free, you're going to find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an important thing. You know, He's truth personified. And here's the key thing. Since He abides forever, He guarantees our freedom in Him. He abides forever. Did you catch that in John chapter 8? He abides forever. Never going to be a time when we go to Him in prayer and, and we get word back and saying, Sorry, no longer at this address. Sorry, that number's been disconnected. You ever try to call somebody and find out their number's been changed? And no way to get a hold of them? Jesus never changes His number. Jesus never changes His address. 
I mean, he never slumbers, he never sleeps, according to the book of Psalms. No matter what our need, we can go to him and he's there. He abides forever. And because we can talk to him at our darkest uh, moments, he is there to help us and to strengthen us so that we can overcome those moments. And perfect love cast out fear. Man, what a great truth. But then notice the next phrase. This one is sort of heartbreaking, but it's reality. It says, because fear hath torment. Fear hath torment. I'm not going to go through a lot of stuff about relating back to my childhood. But I did not have a good childhood. I would not want to relive my childhood days for nothing. Thank you very much. There were a lot of times as a kid that I would lay in bed and be overcome with a combination of both fear and anger all at one time. And you know what? The only person I was hurting with all that fear and anger was me. I was tormenting myself. Fear has torment. I I want you to understand something. The world... The flesh and the devil have nothing to offer that will bring comfort to our souls. If you think you can get get rid of fear by going and talking to your friends who are just as clueless as you are, guess what? It's not going to work. You can always find somebody that will tell you something stupid. Amen? I sure am glad you can go to God and the message you're going to get from God is going to be consistent. I mean, because fear has torment. And and I want you to understand something here. The best Satan has to offer leads to torment. Let let me read for you a a passage out of Revelation 14. And I know this is uh, in the middle of the tribulation time. But I want you to see the, 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 the end result of what happens to those that decide to follow after the devil. Revelation 14 verse 9 it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out uh, without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever re- uh, receiveth the mark of his name. You say, well now preacher, at least we don't have the Antichrist around yet, demanding that we take the mark of the beast. No, we don't have that, but I'm telling you what, the way the governments of the world are going, they are setting the scene up right now for the Antichrist to be able to step on the scene uh, whenever his time comes. I mean, we're seeing some crazy, crazy times. One particular presidential candidate, I'll let let him remain nameless at this time. Uh, His initials are BS. That sounds bad, doesn't it? Maybe we need to cut that out of the tape there. (laughs) Famous moment. <laughs> Famous fall Paul out of the mouth of, of Tom Van. Anyhow, but uh, one of his campaign coordinators saying, listen, if we win the presidency, uh, people that don't agree with us, we're going to put them out in gulags. You say, what's a gulag? Well, that's what they used to do in Russia when they would send people to Siberia. Solzhenitsyn's great book that I have read called the Gulag Archipelago, recounts his times while he was imprisoned because he would not follow the popular opinion of the Soviet government. Wow. And he wants to be the leader of our country. Spooky, isn't it? Spooky. All right? Listen, the devil doesn't have anything to offer except torment. And people yet are still getting lined up to follow uh, his leadership. Listen, let me, let me make a comment and move on real quick. Anxiety, depression, 
alcoholism, drug addiction, addiction, immorality, etc. All of those things, I believe, are, are indications of the torment of fear. Why do people fall into these things? Why? Because they're tormented. They're looking for an escape. They're looking for a way out. And I'm going to tell you, the only good way out is Jesus. Listen, if I hadn't got saved when I was young, if I hadn't trusted Christ as my Savior, I'd have probably ended up in prison. You know why? Because I was heading in a bad direction. And you know one of the reasons? I was angry and afraid. Sure, I'm glad I met Jesus. Amen? He gave me a better reason to live. Thank God. Thank God. And then, let me hit that last phrase. It says, He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So, fear reveals imperfect love. Uh, one of Job's friends, who did not always make wise statements, but he made a comment that I think was probably a little bit, uh, uh, you know, he probably looked within his own heart when he made this comment. But uh, in Job 15.20, Eliphaz said, The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden to the oppressor. The wicked man travaileth with pain all his days. You say, now preacher, I don't know about that. I, I know a lot of people that seem like they're living for the devil, and man, they seem to be having the time of their life. Maybe. I still remember as a teenager when the Rolling Stones hit the stage and Mick Jagger would get there. That was one of the ugliest men that ever walked on the face of the earth. In my opinion, the only guy that was uglier than him was Steven Tyler. Okay, now that's my opinion. You say, I don't know who them people are. God bless you, God bless you. But I still remember Mick Jagger getting up there, skinny dude with a big mouth, and he's singing. You know, here, they, they were successful, they had money, they had adoration, they had big crowds screaming for him. And what was his signature song? I can't get no satisfaction. Without Jesus, you're never going to get satisfaction. Jesus are you going to find satisfaction you know Peter's a classic example of the struggle of imperfect love you know what about it? Jesus came walking out on, uh, to them on the water and they were all afraid and Jesus spoke up and says hey it's me and Peter said well if it's you Lord let me come out there with you he says come on Peter stepped out of the boat and, and according to the scripture he was walking on the water until he took his eyes off Jesus and then he started saying, take your eyes off Jesus. That's when we get in trouble. He also, at the Last Supper, vowed that he would never, never deny the Lord Jesus. And yet before sunup the next morning, he had denied Jesus three times. By the Sea of Galilee... He was frustrated, ready to give up being a disciple and going back to be a fisherman. And Jesus arrived on the scene, called him in, already had fish cooked for him. And uh, Jesus said, Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And Jesus used the Greek word agape, that highest form of love. And Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. But he used the word phileo means I love you like a brother. Second time, Jesus said, do you love me? And he used agape again. And, and Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. But he used phileo again. And the third time, Jesus said, Peter, do you even love me? And he used the word phileo. And that grieved the heart of Peter. You say, well, Peter was sort of a mess up. Oh, but just a few days later, after they'd been praying in the upper room, 
120 of them up there praying in the upper room. Jesus has already ascended back to heaven. They're waiting for their marching orders. And the Bible says the power of the Holy Spirit came down upon them. And from that upper room, they went out into the streets and began to share the gospel with people all over the place. People were coming together saying, what in the world is going on? And Peter, this guy that had denied Jesus, this guy that that, uh, sunk in the water, I mean, this guy that, uh, I mean, had been such a failure in so many ways. He stands up and preaches on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people trust Christ as Savior. And he never turned back. I believe he could have looked up to heaven and said, Lord, you know I love you. And he used the word agape that time. I believe he could have. You see, Fear reveals an imperfect heart and a troubled heart. Here's the good news. Let me, let me leave you with some good news. A troubled heart can be comforted in Jesus. He's the only place we're going to find comfort, dear friend. John chapter 14, verse 1 says this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, unto the Father, but by me. And then drop down to verse number 27. One of my favorite verses. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Fear has torment. Many of us, I might even venture to say all of us, have experienced the torment of fear. Lord knows, I've spent some fearful hours, some fearful nights, some torment. And you know what? We may struggle at times with fear until we arrive in the presence of Jesus. But here's the good news. Though we may struggle, Jesus wants us to find our peace and our confidence in Him. I have learned that if I can genuinely get my focus on the Word of God and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the help of the Holy Spirit of God, I can overcome fear. But that's the only way I can do it. Let me ask you a question. Do you know Him as your Savior? He'll he'll never be able to help you overcome fear until you first know Him. Do you know Him? Are are you willing to find peace and comfort in Him as you face the trials of life? You know, I, I think some people just love to be miserable. Are you willing to give up your misery? Are you willing to turn it over to Jesus? Jesus is the only way we will ever overcome the torment of fear. So what's the bottom line? Look to Jesus constantly, persistently, trustfully. Look to Jesus. And let me encourage you, if you're here today and you've never truly put your faith and trust in Christ, Today's a good day to do it. Just a moment, we're going to stand and sing an invitation song. Let God do His work in your life. The altars are open, whatever your need is. You come and turn it over to Jesus today. Heavenly Father, thank You for loving us. Thank You, Lord, that You show us that fear can be overcome in You. Lord, may that perfect love that You have for us Cast out our fear. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.